every time you get in the pool and go swimming is a win. Every time that you, yeah, of course, when you hit PRs, those are wins, but can we change it to like something that is more frequent and is easier for you to start to stack them up on top of one another? You're listening to Ice Cream with Investors, a podcast that is dedicated to teaching you how to better invest your money so that you can live a more intentional life. I'm your host, Matt Four, and it is my goal to teach and empower you to remove the roadblocks to your financial success. All right, Gavin, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited, uh, super excited to chat ice cream and real estate and hopefully some mindset with you. You got it. You got it. Well, we'll start with the difficult question. What's your favorite ice cream? I don't think there's any answer other than mint chocolate chip. I don't. I don't see why other people would have another answer. So that's my answer. <laughs> so if they're watching the YouTube video, they obviously see that you are a huge Ted Lasso fan. And I don't know if you saw this, but here in the States, we have something called Jenny's ice cream. And Jenny's right no. before the launch of season two came out with biscuits with the boss ice cream flavor. Come I, think on. It, I think it was only limited time. So I couldn't, I've never tried it, but I think that would have to give it a run for its money. Well, one note on that is have you have you heard the the fact that the actress who plays Rebecca has said that those actual biscuits taste like garbage? <laughs> no, like the actual not. ones that she has to eat are not good, she said. Wow. I bet they're yeah. just garbage. So they I, I, I watched this whole YouTube video one time on actors eating and how they do that. Um <laughs> and some actors actually prefer real food because it helps them like be in character and some right. don't because you have to shoot it so many times that they're like, I don't want to eat that same thing. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's that's hilarious. I'll have to check that out. Yeah. Well, tell our listeners, Gavin, what's the scoop? What do you do today? So the scoop for me is I am a, what you would call a combination of a business coach, a personal development coach. Uh, some of my clients call me a woo woo guru. So we could call it a, a mindset coach, uh, a life coach, so to speak. I like to combine it all and call myself a vibe coach, but that doesn't really land too well in the marketing space. So what I essentially do is I work with business owners. I work with people with what we would call a high performance mindset, and I help them perform at their highest level, help them get to the place where, where they feel like they're hitting their potential and doing what they know that they can do. So Tony Robbins mixed in with a little bit of business and finance in the middle. Yeah, man. I, like really, it, you know, he is someone that I like to try and embody. Uh, maybe, maybe we could say Tony Robbins combined with Ted Lasso combined with like, you know, your business, uh, someone who's a well-known business coach. There's too many to think of right now, but. Yeah. Well, those are two pretty good ones. And I'm just <laughs> yeah. on a big Tony Robbins fan right now because or kick right now, because as we're recording this, he's like on every podcast that I listen to. I don't know if he's promoting a book or a course or something yeah. that's going on, but he seems to be doing a big marketing push. So he came top yeah, of mind. He's, his face is out there a lot more. And it's always interesting. I find with those big guys, you know, we, we talk about, you know, what are we doing on a daily basis? Like when I start to see a certain person, like, coming out of the woodwork more again, I'm like, okay, what's happening? You know, what's, what's Tony bringing to the table now? And, and we know if he's, if he's spending that much time and energy to market something and going on podcasts, it's going to be something big and I'm excited about yeah. it. Yeah. Well, yeah. take us back. Um, I know you uh, grew up as a professional athlete and we were kind of talking about high performance um, yeah. athletes and business owners and how we kind of all have this mindset, but I want you to walk us through a little bit of your journey and yeah. uh, your hockey journey and kind of how you got into what you're doing today. Yeah, I think that actually really sets the stage nicely and makes a nice connection for, you know, the real estate investor that's listening and things like that. So I, you know, I'm Canadian kid, so I played hockey growing up and um, I was a goalie and I was always really good at it. Like right from the second I started playing goalie, I was good. Um, I had watched a ton. I had played a ton of like mini hockey and just messing around street hockey. And I just, you know, I just learned it, just picked it up. And when I got to the highest level that I played, which I like the, the highest level technically that I played was, was like junior major junior hockey, which is like one step away from professional hockey. And I got there and I started to encounter 
failure and challenges. And I wasn't the best guy on the ice anymore. And I, I could not handle that. Like I really struggled to deal with that. And actually my draft year, which for those of you who don't know hockey, when, when you turn 18, you get the opportunity to be drafted into the national hockey league. Um, I, what I like to say is I orchestrated a complete meltdown from, from the start of the season to the end, which culminated in a new year's Eve fight where I got my nose punched in and goalies don't fight in hockey just for an FYI. And just, I got traded and just like a whole lot of blaming other people. And, you know, that was when I look back on it, that was a real turning point and inflection point for me um, where I kind of accomplished, I put that in air quotes, something that every high performer is wildly afraid of is I blew it. You know, I was right there and I blew my chance. And so when I share this story with people, I think it allows people to let their guard down a little bit because they go, oh, like this guy has, this guy's blown a chance at millions of dollars in a professional hockey career, right? Anyway, fast forward a little, a little ways. I was, I did, went to college. I did some personal training. I transitioned into online personal training, transitioned into business coaching for personal trainers. And that's when I got the opportunity to work for Craig Ballantyne, which is kind of indirectly the connection, how we got connected. Um, and with Craig, he gave me the opportunity to really kind of spread my wings in this space of personal development and mindset and really dive into some of the stories that, you know, through my business journey and building my own business, I fell into those patterns that I fell into with hockey again. You know, as soon as failure happened, I started blaming people and all that stuff. And, and it finally clicked for me with my own business. And, and, and then I started really diving into it. And that's when I just fell in love with it. And, you know, I think that every high performer, if, if there's even a shred of something that you feel like you could be doing better at, most likely it's not that you don't have enough information. It's probably something between the years. I, there's a lot I want to dig into there and I'm yeah. going to take us down a little sidetrack for a second because sure. you mentioned something that I'm kind of experiencing in my personal life. And I just want your perspective. Um, first of all, did you grow up in a big town? I grew up in what we would say is a small city in Canada. So it's called Winnipeg. Most people don't know it, but it is considered oh, yeah. one of the bigger yeah. cities in Canada. Yep. Were you always taller than everybody? Were you a late birthday? So where is your birthday late in the year? Okay. Always taller than everybody and October, end of October birthday. So one of the things that I'm dealing with right now in our personal life is our son is um, a foot taller than everybody in his grade. I mean, just huge. And he's just, he's a natural athlete. He's pretty athletic. Um, but then you stick him up against some nine-year-olds and he uh, gets his butt beat a little bit, right? They're a yeah. little bit bigger, a little bit faster. And I think at, at seven, it's really who's bigger, better, faster. There's not a ton of skill. 100%. Or tech X. Who's bigger, better, faster, right? Yeah. So he naturally has that at school. He naturally has that in his local soccer club. But we go travel and they need a team to fill in and the older kids play. He just gets so discouraged on that. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to implement right now that failure is an opportunity. Feedback is a gift. And, but it's not really sinking in. And I'm just kind of wondering, sharing from your personal example, how, how would you think about that as, you know, you got this child who's really good at a lot of different things and then goes up against different competition where it's just naturally that they're going to get beat. How do you teach in that moment? Yeah. So, I mean, I can tell you what not to do based on what my <laughs> parents did. Uh, <laughs> but the, again, they were doing the best they could with what they had, just like you are. And I think that the best option here as a parent or as someone trying to help because there's a great lesson in here for your son right that like if mm -hmm. we can if we can get this lesson out of this for him oh man he could be in just such good shape where you and i probably took till we we're 30 to learn this right like just like, so frustrating still right? learning yeah wish that i had known this when i was eight thanks um it is is i think the best option well twofold so my, I'll tell you a story on this one. I won't be too long. My wife's cousin 
is a psychologist who works mainly with, with women with like disordered eating and things like that. But with her three, she has three boys who all played sports. And she said, the only thing that I ever said, unless I was asked for specific feedback was it was great to see how much you enjoyed yourself out there today. Like that was the only thing she ever said to them because she's like, I am not their coach and I don't profess to know Mm. anything about the sport. So just, I think where I'm going with that is the more you can show up as the, Hey, I'm here to support you. And if you're enjoying yourself, that's all I care about. That's really valuable for the kid. And they may not see it today. They may not see it in a month, but in a few years, they'll, that'll land kind of compound interest. Right. The other thing is to really, if I think about what I was focused on, and do the opposite, focus as much as you can on the process, right? So he's probably going to go out for these games with these older kids and he's going to get beat up, but that doesn't mean that he's doing the wrong things, right? We've all played sports and our coaches come in and said, yeah, you guys won that game, but you played like garbage or, you know, Hey, you guys lost that game, but I'm really happy with the way you played. Right? So I think if you, and, and to take it a step deeper, finding tangible markers for success, right? That he has control over. So like, Hey, every time that you had, let's say playing hockey, right? Every time that you had the puck at the blue line, did you get it out of the zone? Right? Like, or, you know, every time that you had the opportunity to make a pass, did you make the pass? Right? Those types of things. And like, he can then focus on those. And then it doesn't really matter if he, struggles overall, or if he's not as high performing, it's, did you do the things that you can control that lead to success? And I, and I think that's, a, there's a bigger lesson in there for all of us, right? Especially in the current real estate climate and all this stuff is like, are you doing the things that you have control over that you know are going to lead to success? And if you keep doing those things, well, first of all, they're going to compound but you're probably, if you're doing the right things, you're just going to succeed by default at some point because you just keep yep. doing the right things. So I, I think that's the lesson, right? Because I do some business coaching as well. And when I was going through some planning with one of our clients the other day, he we were talking about his business. And one of his goals was to grow his revenue by 33%, which translated into $250,000. They said, okay, well, if we want to do that, what's your quarter goal? Well, I want to grow by $250,000. Well, let's take it down. The quarter goal should be to grow it by $65,000. Right. And you want to grow your customer base as well. Why don't you start by calling your first hundred customers and asking for a referral and trying to cross sell what you already have? Because that will be the person you want to be as someone that gets in this goal of calling your customers, trying to cross sell and ask for referrals. But I asked him to do one more thing, and I would love to hear your opinion on this, is you can absolutely sit here for 36 hours and call all 100 of them straight down the list and get a hold of all of them. Or for the next nine weeks, you can call three a day. And I'm going to ask that you do three a day because then you get into the habit of becoming the person that when you start your day, you know that this is the habit I have or this is the goal that I have. And now you're becoming the person that just institutes that into their daily rhythm. Yeah. And and I think that's so actually the first time that I ever met your friend, Chris Larson, that was one of the things that came up when we were talking about mindset was um, if you, if you are afraid, you know, that you're not going to succeed at something simply because you've never done it. Right. So this, this business coaching client who has never hit this income level, well, then you got to think about, well, the person who has done it, what do they do? Like, who are they? What do they do? And then it seems so simple. Just act as if you're that person already. Right. (laughs) Right. And like, we know that someone who has a highly successful sales based or, or, you know, service based business picks up the phone. And they make phone calls and they service their clients and they make sure their clients are happy. And when their clients are happy, they ask for referrals and they have a system to ask for referrals. Well, start putting that in place, 
right? I did the exact same thing with actually a, a home builder client who is looking for investors in his projects because he's, I mean, it's a tough sledding out there right now. And I said, like, you've got a list of a hundred people who, you know, either could invest with you or know people who could invest with you. You need to send a direct personal email to two of those people every single day That's it. for five days a week for the next 10 weeks. And That's then you've, you've made it through the hundred people. And like, we know someone's going to pop out of that woodwork with a hundred K, right? <laughs> like someone's yeah. going to pop out. So, you know, Chris is an endurance cyclist and one of our first conversations was really on endurance cycling and I'm an Ironman athlete and all this. And when you hear about an Ironman, which is a 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike, 26.2 mile run, your first question is like, how do you even do that? And my answer is always like, you have to do the work, which means daily actions towards that goal. I know that some days I'm going to go out and have a fantastic workout. And some days I'm going to feel like crap, but on the days that I feel like crap, I at least have to do something because that's moving me towards my goal, whether it be lowering the intensity, lowering the miles, stretching, doing some strength work, doing something because it's getting there. What, when, when I see people fail, it's because they miss a workout, miss that activity and double Mm -hmm. up on it the next day. And what you end up doing is burning yourself out, getting hurt and, and running out of steam to get to your goal. Yeah. Or one other thing that I see is they miss it or they, you know, they, they miss it or whatever, try and double up or something. And then they're so busy judging themselves. And this is what I did, right? They, they quote unquote fail and they're so busy judging themselves for that mistake that they made that they forget that there's a huge lesson in there, right? Which could be something, let's say for training for an Ironman, right? Is, well, maybe you didn't plan and prepare well enough. Uh, Maybe you didn't eat well enough or sleep well enough. And there's a great, a real nugget of a lesson in that failure of you missing a day. And if it was because you were too tired, well, then you got to get your sleep locked in because, you know, no one cares if you're too tired when you're in the middle of the ocean swimming in the middle of your Ironman, right? So you got to get your sleep locked in or you got to get your nutrition locked in or, you know, and this is where if we bring it back to my story where I made that mistake, right? I thought that failure meant that I wasn't good enough, right? That's a very, what Carol Dweck would call a fixed mindset, right? Whereas if we can look at failure, if your son can look at failure, if an Ironman person can look at failure, if a real estate investor or a high performer can look at failure as feedback, as an opportunity to learn, you're going to be so much further ahead because then there is nothing you you can't do anything wrong. You just learn faster when you make mistakes, right? So as being in this podcast for 18 minutes now, you seem to be a guy that might have some processes around how we do this. And a uh, quick tangent. I think when, when we f- sit around at the end of the year and we look at our goals, some people are killing it. Some people aren't. And the people that aren't are like, yeah, but I just learned so much this year. And then you're like, okay, what did you learn? Yeah. Crickets. Yeah. I don't think when failure happens that we spend the time to really self absorb self uh, self reflect and think about what are those key pieces of information that I learned. So what, what advice do you have for somebody that goes through a failure, goes through a uh, roadblock, and instead of you want them to move forward, but you do want to take time to reflect, how do, how do we go through that process? Yeah. So one of the things when it comes to failure, I've talked to a few groups about reframing failure. And um, like I said, one of the things is we kind of get so you know, into this, this like narrative that we're, we are a failure if we fail. Right. So the first thing that I say to people when, when you experience a failure is to just take, take a moment, just like take a beat here, just take a breath and separate yourself from the experience of failing. Just give yourself some time. And then to recognize that I I like to say it as judgment and curiosity live next door to each other. Okay. So judgment and curiosity are both very valuable emotions in different contexts. Once you have failed, judging yourself and beating yourself up does not serve you. 
Something that's right next door to judgment, like I said, is curiosity. And that serves you really, really well because that can allow you to pull the lesson out of the failure. The only difference between judgment and curiosity is punctuation. When you're judging yourself, you're ending the sentence in a period or sometimes an exclamation point. I suck. I'm the worst. I can never, I'll never do this. I'll never succeed. When you change it to curiosity, do I suck? Am I the worst? Is it that I'll never succeed? And this starts to lead us down a path where we can start to ask better questions. Our brains are built to solve problems. It's literally what they've been programmed to do over centuries. The problem is 99% of the time, and I know we're both guilty of this, we don't give it very good problems to solve. So when we fail and we make a mistake, if we can get, the faster we can get curious, right? Because now we have information that we didn't have before we failed, right? We know that this thing that we tried doesn't work, right? So let's get curious, ask questions, and then our brain can go to work on solving the problem, on, on making sure that we don't fail again. Because really what matters about failure is that we can pull out the lesson and the next time that that same situation happens, that we can respond in a different way that gives us a better chance at success. Judgment and curiosity are live next to each other uh, are, is a fantastic tweetable quote right there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I love this idea of like your mind is set on problem solving and trying to solve problems because I truly believe one of the definitions of success in life is choosing which problems you're going to focus on. It doesn't that. mean that we all don't have problems, but when something happens, I'm just going to kind of pull on a thread that you introduced here. Something happens. Yeah. I'm thinking I suck. This sucks. All those sorts of things. And then I get a flat tire. I'm thinking, why does this always happen to me? It's I'm, I'm so I'm not focused right then on choosing the problem I want to focus on. But if you do have control over what problems you want to choose in life, then chances are you're being pretty successful. And I always like to say, if money can solve a problem, you don't have a problem. So exactly. I, uh, I like that little thread you put. That's another there. tweetable. That's another tweetable. Yeah, you know, like and, and I'll, I'll, I'll say this, right? Like, um, there's a really great, uh, the ethics of it are questionable, but there's a really great, uh, documentary on Netflix where Jonah Hill essentially interviews his therapist named Phil Stutz. I don't know if you've seen it. Mm -mm. It's called Stutz. Um, and it's questionable because he's literally like interviewing his therapist about his problems. It's kind of weird, but he's trying to highlight this therapist and how incredible his tools are. And one of the things he says is we need to recognize as human beings. And I fell into this so badly that we're always going to have problems. Like there's never going to be a time in your life where you can put your feet up on your desk, lean back in your chair and say, I'm done. And I always had that thought where I was like, well, when, when I do this, when I do this, when I do this, you know, I'm going to be done or life is going to get easier. There's always problems, right? You think of like, um, Elon Musk, he's got a lot of problems. They're just better problems than you and I have. Yeah. Right. Um, someone said something like Elon Musk and the guy, the homeless guy on the corner, both have money problems. Which type of money problems do you want to have? Right. Another, another piece of gold. I like another it. piece of, tw of, of Twitter gold. Speaking <laughs> of Elon Musk. Right. So I think that that's, if we can accept, this took me a long time to accept. If we can accept that we're always going to have problems to solve, then it kind of frees us up to go, oh, well, if I'm always going to have problems, then let's make sure that they're good problems, like you mm -hmm. said, right? And then we can like actually pursue better problems. And that's when we kind of get to that, like, you know, new levels, new devils, right? You, you've you got a tiny business and your, your, your problem or your devil is, I can't get enough leads. I don't have enough money to pay rent. And then your business grows and it's, you know, I need to hire faster and I need to manage my team better and all of these things, or right? I need to make sure that I manage all these 
all these clients that are in the funnel that I can't even keep track of anymore. Still problems are just way better yeah. ones. Way better ones. So yeah. one of the kind of switching this to real estate or to investing, one of the problems I see with real estate investors is this idea of finite versus infinite mindset. This idea of yes. scarcity and abundance mindset. And things really started clicking for me when I saw the, well, I'll tell you the first time, the first time I ever created a digital asset and posted it on the internet, like a small PDF, and somebody bought that. It was like $2.99. It showed me that I can literally create money out of nothing. Mm. And it switched my mindset towards money is abundant. If I solve problems, I will create opportunities that will drive income. But probably one of the challenges that real estate investors have is this idea of, oh, if the deal doesn't work, that's a lot of money and those sorts of things. So I guess, how do we, how do we switch this gear from finite mindset to abundant mindset? Hey, fellow investors, before we dive into our next segment of the show, I wanted to take a quick moment to talk to you about a fantastic opportunity for you to invest with me. As you know, here at Ice Cream with Investors, I'm passionate about real estate investing and helping you navigate the exciting world of wealth creation through real estate. And that's why for the first time, I'm thrilled to tell you about an opportunity for you to invest alongside of me. Over the past three years, I've been investing in multifamily, mobile home parks, car washes. I've even become the bank and lent out money to fellow real estate investors on a short-term basis. And now you can come join me. If you'd like to jump on a call and learn more about this opportunity, head to icecreamwithinvestors.com slash invest and find a time for us to connect. And now back to the show. I... So there's a couple of things you touched on there, like, and I think we should just because it was introduced, we should just touch on Simon Sinek's finite game versus infinite game. Then we'll touch on scarcity versus abundant mindset. So one thing that I think a lot of us as former athletes or your current athlete, and, 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 and again, even if you were never an athlete and you're listening to this, but you, you are the type of person who wants to win. And if you're listening to a podcast about real estate investing, you're a high performer. Like people who aren't high performers don't listen to this stuff. So we get caught in this. I, it's kind of like this, this athlete's mindset, right? So when you're playing a sport or, or you're playing chess or something like that, that's what's what Simon Sinek calls a finite game. There's rules, there's opponents, and the finite game is played to be finished. Like it's played to be ended, right? That's a finite game. The problem is the games that matter in our lives, business, marriage, fitness, life, right? They're all infinite games, which Simon Sinek calls like, there's not really any rules. There's no opponents and there's no like way, there's no way to tell if you're winning or losing. And the infinite game is played to be continued to be played. The way That's you win it. an infinite game is you continue playing, right? You stay married, you stay fit, you stay alive, right? You stay in business, right? So what, what I, the mistake I made is I from, I went from a hockey scoreboard to my scoreboard was money. And I thought that, okay, that's how I'm going to win at the game of business is I'm just going to keep making more and more and more money until I started making more and more and more money. And the goalposts just kept moving further and further and further away. If you think the next home investment that you make, if you think the next hundred thousand or million dollars that you get into your portfolio is going to change you in some way, you're dead wrong. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, but you're wrong. It's, it's not going to make your life better. Like, yes, having more money and more assets, it makes life easier. We can all agree on that. But if you think that it's going to like somehow drastically change things for you, I think you're just barking up the wrong tree. And like you have way more ability to make that change right now without having to add any assets to your roster. Right. Yeah. So I that, mean, put, go put ahead. Put differently, as my boy Biggie Smalls once said, mo money, mo problems. Tweet, tweetable. <laughs> um, Biggie. Uh, so that's kind of like this infinite game versus finite game. And, and I, I say that where like, 
a friend of mine and, and I were chatting and, and he had said he had gone to his first therapy session and he's a former like high level basketball player. And, uh, and I said to him, well, what's the biggest takeaway from your first you know, couple of therapy sessions? And he said that my athlete's mindset is killing me. The fact, cause he's a CEO of a, uh, of a tech, like tech pharmacy, pharmaceutical company. He said, my mindset around trying to win all the time and be competitive all the time is killing me. So I'm glad that you brought up this idea of infinite game. I love that by Simon Sinek, by the way. Um, the thing I struggle with, with infinite game is there are rules to business. Like you can't go to negative a million dollars and still have a sustaining business. So how do we, how do we structure what winning looks like or what progress looks like? and business and relationships and sport, knowing that there, there are some boundaries that we play within. Yeah. So I think that this is where, when you're playing an infinite game, this is where you, you get to choose how you define your wins, right? So like I said, my scoreboard just turned into dollar signs. So it was like, that's the only way that I could win was by making more money. But, you know, when we, when we bring up your Iron Man, Iron Man idea, or we look at, cause, cause that could be considered a finite game, but an, an Iron Man winning an Iron Man, quote unquote, a win for Matt might be just showing up and starting the race. It might be just finishing the race without an injury. Um, Whereas for me in business, if we look at like how I shifted is a win for me is that I can take care of my family financially and be present, right? I can leave here after we finish this and I can go and be present with my wife in the evening. That's a win. Like that's how I define a win. And no amount of, uh, you know, no extra 20000 or $30,000 in gross revenue is going to, ch is going to make, is going to change that if I can't show up for her. Right. And, and, it, and, and that's just what I choose as the win for me. And that's from having chased the other stuff too. Yeah. Right? Well, and we talked a little bit before the show. I mean, I, there was a time in my Ironman career where I was going all over the world and competing and being disappointed after every race for not achieving what I thought I could achieve. However, if I would have shaped my mindset too, but I'm still healthy, I had fun, I love this sport, and I get to go do it again, that was when I was the happiest in my life. Instead, there's a lot of people, including myself, like I've taken some years off of the sport because I just had this scoreboard that I was looking at versus changing that. Hey, if I can keep doing this in a healthy way, that's a positive. That's a win. Yeah. And, and I'll even bring this to, to business, right? Like, so one of my clients, I remember him kind of like, he came to me and he was just saying, Oh, I'm just struggling. I'm just having a tough time right now. You know? And one of the big things I always say to my clients is like, you got to look for wins. You've got to look for evidence that you're moving in the right direction. And so I said to him, so how do you define a win? And he said, well, every time that I close a new client, it's like, okay, well, something important to know about him and his business is most of his clients, it's, he's a publishing, he's, he's a publishing company. So his clients are like 10, 25, $50,000 clients. If he closes one a week, it's, it's, it's a positive. So the way he defined a win was something that he sees maybe once a week. So his, his like time between quote unquote wins was yep. way too long. So we needed to redefine what is a win for you in your business, right? So a win could be, as we had talked about earlier, um, you know, making three reach outs. A win could be uh, every time that a client gets their book published is another way that we win because we're delivering a great service, right? we need to reframe these wins because if we're going to be brainwashing ourselves either way to like feel like crap or feel great, we may as well brainwash ourselves to feel great. Cause like I'm telling you right now, you're brainwashing yourself one way or the other. So if we were to brainwash ourselves to feel good, then it would probably be like, well, 
how many different places can we find wins? Can we find evidence that we're moving in the right direction? And then, you know, even in the Ironman example, it's like every time you strap on your shoes and go for a run is a win. Every time you get in the pool and go swimming is a win. Every time that you, yeah, of course, when you hit PRs, those are wins, but can we change it to like something that is more frequent and is easier for you to start to stack them up on top of one another? I hate that you just repeat it back what I say to like everybody that asked me about doing it Ironman, uh, which <laughs> is that you just have to put the hay in the barn. There's no yes. other way around it. One thing I love about the sport is there's nobody that's genetically dispositioned to do this sport better than the others. Being uh, LeBron James, I always use him as an example, being 6'7", 225 pounds of solid muscle, can jump out of the gym. That dude was just born to be an athlete. And don't get me wrong. He's done a lot of great work. I love his work ethic and how clean he keeps his body and the focus around staying healthy and doing those sorts of things. But in Ironman, like you don't see that. So it just takes years and years and years to show up at a, at an elite level. And so to your point, like getting in the pool that day is progress forward because you're going to be a better swimmer. If you swim more being out on the bike and coming back healthy and being able to do it again is a progress. Cause if you get in a wreck or if you get hit by a car or something like that, and it takes you out for a couple months that you're not going to be able to progress. So yeah. I like this idea of let's reframe what a win is and find them in our daily lives and make them geared towards the direction we want to go versus the outcome of where, yeah. what we want. Yeah. That, that's such a great way to put it. And I think, I think we can, I think we can put a cap on that with that. I, I, I love the way you, you put that. Let's, let's talk about money. How about, how about we talk about money? You cool with that? Scarcity? Yeah, I love, that I love money. Um, yeah. So you had, you had talked about like similar to infinite finite is, is scarcity versus abundance with, which, which, as you said, right. Scarcity is, we believe that there is, if we're in scarcity mindset, it's this like that there's a scarce amount to go around. There's only so much to go around. Whereas if we can get into an abundant mindset, we can believe that there is always, always enough, always more than enough. And I think that scarcity versus abundance mindset when it comes to money is the basis of it that we have to look at is how do you view money, right? So I grew up in the generation. I'm a middle-class kid right? Mom was a teacher. Dad was a cop, you know, not blue collar, but it, it was always touch and go with the monthly fees. Right. And it was money doesn't grow on trees. Right. Well, and I heard that and that was hammered into me and probably most of our generation it was hammered into. But like, if we look at it, like money's paper, and actually, like, it does grow on trees. It kind of does. Yeah. It kind of does. And even if we look further, like, money at its core is an exchange of value, right? There was a time where money was a goat or wheat or these weird coins that they blacksmiths made, right? And now money, for the most part, is a card that you tap or numbers on a screen that can just be manipulated in any way. So like, what is money? Actually, it's just an exchange of value. And this like changes our view because as you said, right? Well, then if I just create more value for people who have money, then I can therefore create money for myself. And that's really what it is. So the scarcity mindset is just a miss. It's like a misjudgment of what money is, right? Because, okay, is there a scarce amount of hundred dollar bills on the planet earth? There is a finite amount of those. That being said, the government showed pretty quickly that they can just print more of that when they need to in the middle of COVID. So I'll, I'll yeah. even debate that, but the amount of value that can be exchanged is quite literally infinite. So when we look at money as a finite thing or business as a finite, that you can only have so much business, like it's just a flawed concept. And um, 
one of the things that I want to share with with your audience is this this daily money attraction video that we have on YouTube. It's completely free, and it reframes. I won't give a, I won't give too much away, but it reframes the way you think about money to an abundant way of thinking about money, how much there is, how much is available to you. Because the only thing that is keeping you from having as much money as you could ever imagine, again, is the way you think about it. Yes. And I love that you, I get asked frequently about like money and what is money. And I do think it's a store of value. It's a store of previous yeah. value and an exchange for future value from someone else. That's exactly so, it. Yeah. Yeah. And when you do think about it that way, people have made money doing anything out totally. there. As long as it solves a problem for somebody else, they are going to give up what they have given value for to get what you can give value to. Totally. And I, I think that kind of takes away this like power that we give money. Yes. Yes. Right. And it allows us to go, oh, like, well, if it's just like energy and value, well, I can do that. Yep. Great. So, yeah, there's something Gav there. Gavin, I'm going to be cognizant of your time and switch us now to our last round. We call these the four toppings. Our first one is what is your favorite book or what is a book you've read recently that's given you a paradigm shift? So, the book that I recommend most to people uh, around a lot of the mindset and spiritual work that I do is called Ask and It Is Given. Uh, it's by a couple named uh, Esther and Jerry Hicks. And it's actually, this is where it gets a little woo-woo. It's the teachings of Abraham Hicks. And I'll let people, I'll let people read and learn about that. It's actually, I think there's a free audio book on YouTube of it. Um, Ask and It Is Given. Um, I'll go with that. Perfect. Our second one is what is the best piece of advice you've ever received? Man, you warned me about this and you still caught me off guard. Um, the best piece of advice I ever received, I don't remember who it's from, but it's like realistic is not a real concept. Like realistic is in your own mind. Right. So being realistic or being quote unquote normal is a construct of your mind. So stop being so damn realistic. I heard this, uh, it's kind of paraphrasing and pulling on that string. It was like, just the idea that you could think of something like that doesn't make it impossible because the, right. you've, you've got that idea in your mind, which means that you can think of ways to achieve it. Yeah. And that's like law of attraction, like quantum physics. A lot of what we've been talking about is like, if you can think of it, that would mean that it is possible. Right. Right. Yeah. Our third one is what are you most proud of in your life? Man, I am most proud of the fact that I took a massive weakness that was my mindset and my resilience and my ability, my, my straight up inability to deal with failure. And I won't say I'm done, but I have made massive strides in shifting that like a complete 180. Like even from when my wife and I met, which was 12 years ago, a lot of people have told me and I feel that I am a completely different person and I'm really proud of that. Yeah. To stare your own demons in the face and conquer yeah. them. And I'm still staring. They're still there. <laughs> yeah. They're just a little smaller. Well, our fourth and final one is if you could sit down and eat a bowl of ice cream with anyone dead or alive, who would it be and why? I would have to say it would be my paternal grandfather. Actually, probably both of my grandfathers. Let's say that both of my grandfathers. I never got to meet my maternal grandfather. Um, and my paternal grandfather, my, my dad's dad, he passed away when I was about five or six years old and they lived over in England. So I didn't really get to see him much or get to know him much. But um, I know that they both lived very different lives than I live. Um, and I think that there's a ton that I could learn from their experience as well. And just like, you know, there's something about meeting your ancestors, you know? 
Yeah. I mean, dude, they didn't even have uh, mint chocolate chip when he was around. I would be blowing their mind. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Gavin, fantastic conversation. If our listeners wanted to reach out to you, learn more about you, where is the best place we can point them? Yeah, the best place is Instagram at Gavin McHale one. I share a lot of like tips and tricks and shorter, shorter form things. But if you do want to get that, uh, start shifting your mindset around money, uh, dailymoneyattraction.com takes you to a YouTube video. It's again, it's completely free. You don't have to put in any information. It's about a nine minute video. Uh, you don't even need to close your eyes. You could do it while you're walking or driving, but we do suggest that you do like more of a meditation style. Uh, so I encourage people to go check that out and get a good idea of, of my beliefs around money. Perfect. We will link all those in the show notes. And then Gavin, thanks for coming on. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Ice Cream with Investors. If you like what we serve you here, it would mean the world to me if you would like, subscribe, and leave a review on your favorite podcast app.